um, uh, Martine, and then uh, this man in front, and that may be all the time we have. I just wanted to ask some questions about the um, entrapment laws, because we have some lawyers on the In that report that you just referenced, Sean, about the training material, there's also uh, like thousands of what the connection is between the two things. In other words, somebody gets picked up on a minor charge and then they say, well, now we're going to send you to go right. spy on other people. Well, the only way to get off the no-fly list is to become an informant. I heard another one was an American say that they, they're actually serving yeah. the yeah. that. I mean, that's a, that presents a different question from that of entrapment. And entrapment is when essentially the government tries to implant the idea and the motive for a crime in somebody else, right? And so yeah. the government is organizing. There was certainly a lot of, uh, there was a lot of government uh, involvement as in the COINTELPRO program in trying to foment certain kinds of violence, say, you know, in the South uh, during the Civil Rights Movement. Um, and and even that is different from entrapment. Um, I, I, you know, I get, you know, I guess some people could allege that they were entrapped for having done that. But the first tactic that you describe is basically how most drug rings are brought down, that they go after the low level people and then they have them turn state's evidence against the next level and the next level and so on. Um, and that's totally it's, it's lawful to do that, yeah. It's lawful to do that and I mean basically that that's kind of how the, the legal system operates. It's based on plea bargaining and without that you lose plea bargaining. But just to note, we have 10 minutes. Go ahead. So, so A, entrapment matters increasingly. It, it, it offers less for Section 2 defendants. The entrapment standard says that if the government can prove that you had a predisposition to commit any offense, however trivial, like fraud, it then defeats a claim of entrapment over any subsequent offense, however grandiose, like terrorism. So what the FBI does, and this is, I think, you know, one of the reasons it becomes problematic, is that, that there will be an active effort to bribe people outright. And I can think of a case in Newburgh, New York, for African-American Muslims bribed. Again, this was a $100,000 investigation started out. One of them is a schizophrenic, two of them are heroin addicts, and the other one hadn't held down a job in 20 years. But supposedly, for three years, two and a half years, they conspired and collaborated a very sophisticated scheme to supposedly bomb the synagogue. But then it turns out that the, 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 the scheme was initiated, it was funded, it was equipped all by the FBI. The entrapment defense doesn't actually give people a way to resist prosecutions in those arenas because they did have a predisposition to commit fraud, right? And so that basically defeats the subsequent claim. The coercive informant recruiting is a sort of separate issue, and the reason I think it's not quite comparable to the drug context is twofold. The first is that in the drug war context, we'll actually go after low-level officers. Whereas in the war on terror context, we don't go after low-level operators, we go after random community members, right. right? The FBI has a program of sort of you know, voluntary interviews. You're, if you're not under a criminal investigation, there's no um, requirement that you talk to investigators. But the FBI, because they conduct intelligence operations separate from criminal investigations, and in the intelligence arena, constitutional rights don't apply, they can do, and these are voluntary interviews where you do have a right not to participate, but once you're in that box, all bets are off. And so if we have cases around the country of people talking to the FBI because they wanted to demonstrate that they presented no threat, you know, that they were just law-abiding people, and then the next thing that happens is bam, do you want to spy on your neighbors? And if you don't, there are both carrots and sticks. There are carrots, you know, they'll offer you immigration incentives. Oh, we'll get your, your relatives here. And then there are also sticks. Oh, you know, so-and-so might find it really hard to particularly get a green card or get their citizenship uh, and I can think of the last thing I'll just say here, there's a case in Southern California, not the Irvine 11, but another one, the CARE in LA and the ACLU are suing now, another in an undercover infiltration of a mosque. In that case, an individual from the community came to the FBI 
They went to the LAPD. They said, there's someone in our mosque preaching violence. Okay, the someone in the mosque preaching violence was an FBI informant sent to you know, instigate plots. So who's serving the counterterrorism sentence now for 25 years? The person who went to the FBI to rat out the informant because then they wanted him to be an informant and when he resisted, they asked him a bunch of questions. Uh, the, two most count, uh, the two most common counterterrorism charges are lying to a federal agent and material support for terrorism, which can include expert advice, which is to say neither of them have anything to do with terrorism. And so this person was uh, convicted because when he was asked to list his international trips, he listed a bunch of trips, and one of his trips didn't make the list. That's an omission. He didn't even say a lie. He just omitted a fact that then became the basis for what the government calls a terrorism charge. What's the case? Do you know? It's, uh, his name is Abdullah Niazi, N-A-N-I-A-Z-I. 